Hello, beloved, and welcome back to our next Sunday evening lesson. This is the Church of Christ at Millview welcomes you. We're glad that you're tuning in. Hope that uh, this week is uh, going to be a great one for you. To start off, we want to tackle a subject matter that we're all kind of living through. I actually preached this sermon for the first time in 2015, and I think it still has application at any time because whatever might be coming down the pike, we don't know. And being prepared for the tough times, it's just a good conversation to have ahead of the event. And the big one here can stand for any number of events. I know some people have lived through tornadoes and earthquakes and hurricanes. Uh, not many of us understand weapons of mass destruction, but certainly there are Christians in the world that have experienced those. There are the threats of uh, EMPs, uh, blackouts, economic collapses, and those are more at the severe side of things. Anarchy and lawlessness, religious or political persecution. It could be any number of these, or it could be all of these and others besides, but it's going to be big in nature. And a growing number of our fellow Americans have been taking a keen interest in survivalism and prepping for the big one, whatever the big one may be. And some of you may already be doing this. You already have your supplies. You already have your post. Uh, your spot has been picked out. But maybe it's time that we started thinking of this as members of the church and not just as individuals. Now, there's nothing wrong with the prepper movement, and there may be everything right with it. But I'm not here to make up your mind one way or another. Uh, my aim in this lesson is just to ask, how are the Lord's people going to react when we do get the big one? And this goes beyond a discussion of having a disaster emergency plan in place. What we're looking at is how the church functions as individuals and as a group when everything normal around us is suddenly turned upside down. Will that event unify us as a body or will it drive us apart? Will it bring out our best or will it reveal our worst? And I know some members of the church have actually gone through world upside down turning events. Some uh, have lived through uh, the Katrina event in which their entire home was flooded and they had to move. Others I know have lived through tornadoes and it devastated their community. Their home was lost and even lives of their neighbors were taken. And so this will sink in for some of us more than others. And certainly the present crisis that we have been living in brings this even uh, more clarity and makes it even more relevant to our discussing it today. But what we want to consider more than anything is how are we preparing for the big one as the Lord's church? Let's talk about it. In the first place, we can identify this question. Are we securing a strategy? You know, most things fall back onto some plan, some strategy that's been thought out in advance. So we're ready for the moment. Jesus tells us about Daniel's prophecy, the destruction of Jerusalem, which uh, those prophecies in Daniel refer to it as the abomination of desolation. And we hear, we read about this in Matthew 24, 4 through 35, but it's found in Daniel 11, 31 and chapter 12, verse 11. What this was for Judaism is it was their big one. <laughs> Now, not all big ones are divine retribution, such as was the case for the destruction of Jerusalem, the abomination of desolation. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, John the baptizer warns, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is a, an allusion, a reference to the impending destruction of Jerusalem. It signaled that future punishment, which would be uh, ultimately expressed in the year AD 70. And these prophecies, which we've just mentioned, were totally fulfilled. 
and Jerusalem was actually destroyed, and the temple was indeed desecrated. However, this punishment was aimed at disobedient Jews, and those in Judea who responded to Jesus' words in this passage here in Matthew 24, they were secured with a strategy. What was the what was the strategy Jesus offered? In Matthew chapter 24, verses 16 through 18, Jesus says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. So there's the strategy. Not all were going to be caught off guard when Judaism experienced its big one. And those who survived heeded Jesus' words. The Proverbs teach us in 1921, it says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. Amen. Jesus' plan was the only plan that worked when Titus and his armies were coming in to Jerusalem uh, in the years prior to AD 70. And no matter what we say we are going to do when the big one hits, isn't it all talk until we're finally in it? But at least tonight, we can confront this subject matter, perhaps in a way in which members don't regularly do. We need to talk about this openly and work through this ahead of time within our families so that what I hope I and I think my family is going to do in response actually will be the response that we take. It's about conditioning our Christianity for the event. And it's a trait found in the best soldiers and in the best athletes, such as the purpose of our first point in which we ask, are we securing a strategy? But now consider in the second place, are we shielding our fidelity? Fidelity is a word that has to do with faithfulness or trustworthiness and loyalty. It has to do with pressing forward and keeping to the task faithfully. If you go back to that passage we've been studying in Matthew 24, in this context of the destruction of Jerusalem, you have a description of the factors leading up to that destruction of Jerusalem and the two kinds of people that were going to experience it. Beginning in verse 7, Jesus says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now drop down to verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. The words endures and saved, they've got to fit the context, and the context is the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore, the primary interpretation has to do with those who are going to factually survive the Roman assault on Jerusalem in AD 70. That's the primary interpretation. But you know, we can take this and make a spiritual secondary interpretation or application and draw on the similarities there between how we endure spiritually and how that leads to our being saved. Sadly, not all are prepared for their faith to be tested. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 reminds us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And this passage tells me that I play a role in how my faith leads to my salvation. And it's something that I can actually prepare for ahead of time. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes, I'm sorry, Peter writes rather, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. And that brings to our mind a paradox about shielding our faith. Because what we're learning here is that if we shield our faith, if, if I protect my faith and guard it when it's not under fire, when it's not experiencing trials, then what I've done is I've made my faith strong so that when I am under attack, when my faith is being tested, we will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. So you, it's like uh, building up layers and layers and layers of a shield. The more layers I 
can build to my shield. The more time I spent uh, keeping the equipment of warfare, spiritual warfare, um, at its peak condition and keep it working well and not rusting or or breaking apart or uh, just being faulty in some way. If I am working to keep my faith what it ought to be, then when I'm under assault, I'll be able to endure. My faith works for me in that moment, just as it should. Beloved, when you and I take the time to think about these potential tests upon our fidelity to God, and we do it during the off season, so to speak, then we will reap the benefits of that later. We'll find ourselves brainstorming just how our faith would survive in response to this trial or that various circumstance. But when a person when a person faces the big one and hasn't been practicing in the off season, it may become a severe challenge to his or her faith. So the second question for this hour is in prepping for the big one, are we shielding our fidelity? But now consider point number three, are we stockpiling for unity? Jesus taught in Mark chapter three, verses 24 through 25, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. It's not possible. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Factions within a cause undermine the entire movement to its own peril. When the big one hits, whose kingdom will you belong to? In the stress of displacement or persecution, I may be tempted to suspend my Christianity in order to cope with the trauma. I may deny my Lord. Um, I may even, under threat of duress, disparage his church in order to survive. Somehow, survival instincts have kicked in, but they've done so in the worst possible way, believing that somehow surviving without Christ is even possible. This is wrong. There are not situations over here where I apply this set of ethics and then other situations over there where I apply that set of ethics. Listen, listen carefully, beloved. All Christian ethics are always applied, always. That is the ongoing condition of faithfully living as a Christian. Being a Christian during the hard times, what does that do? It lets us know we are Christians indeed and not a fair weather friend. My Christian family has got to mean more to me than any other group of people. The apostle taught, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Galatians chapter six, verse 10. Referring back to Mark chapter three, verses 24 through 25, that passage, which has to do with um, you know, a house being divided against itself. Isn't it interesting that Jesus moves, he pivots from that discussion to one that's pointed at this very idea about family and how our Christian family must be the most important. In that same chapter, Mark 3, look at verses 32 through 35. It reads, and a multitude was sitting around Jesus and they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But Jesus answered them saying, who is my mother or who my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So who gets my devotion? Who gets my attention? Who gets my care? when the big one hits? Is it just my own flesh and blood, my family, or will it be my fellowship? You know, the blood of Jesus Christ is thicker than the blood we share with our relatives. If given the option, will we come together for the work of the Lord, for the preservation of the faith of Christians, or are we gonna to scatter to the four winds? Jesus, speaking of the Jewish leaders who should have loved the Israelites, said in John chapter 10, verse 12 through 13, 
but a hireling who is not the shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. Now, look, it may be true that not one of us can love the church like Jesus did, but we need to examine how serious our love is for each other. Because later that love is going to be tested. I would like to think my family and I would put the Lord's church first. When we experience the big one, will we still be here? Are we still united? So in the third place, consider, are we stockpiling for unity? But now in the fourth place, let's ask this question. Are we shoring up for stability? In doing some research for this sermon, I ventured into the various codes and terminology that is commonly used by preppers. And there is a phrase, zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure. I don't think this has anything to do with the living dead, which is a popular theme for TV and movies these days. Instead, it refers to when decent people turn desperate against their fellow man, even their own neighbors to take from them resources for survival during a major catastrophe. Now that, doesn't that concept just make you feel warm and lovely all over? I mean, that's, what, a, what an idea. And I'm not sure what happens, but something triggers in a person in times of distress. On the voyage to Rome, for example, in Acts chapter 17, verse 10, Paul advised the centurion leading that group and the helmsman saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. And you know what? They ignored Paul, and the ship was caught in the storm. Only this time Paul told the men, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Verses 22 and 26. And then Picking up in verse 29 and moving forward, then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men in the ship stay, you cannot be saved. Now, note their reaction to Paul's advice. We read this in verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff. That seems contrary to any sensible thing that a person would do in that situation. And yet, they were willing to listen to this Christian man. And they let it fall off. And Paul, in that moment, continued to be a stabilizing source for all of those panicked people. And he did that by encouraging the passengers to eat and even blessing their bread before God. When they finally ran the ship aground, it was the soldier's plan to kill the prisoners. But the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land and the rest, some on boats and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Verses 42 through 44. When the world is in panic mode and it becomes every man for himself and government is powerless, that's when the church of Christ, using God's word, relying on the comfort and peace and stability we have from our relationship with God, that's when we need to try to bring stability and order to all those around us. So in the fifth place, in prepping for the big one, are we shoring up for stability? Now, fifth and finally, would you consider this question? Are we set for gospel delivery? 
When I think of the ultimate prepper family, I can't help but think that that's got to be Noah. I mean, think about it. They were prepping for their day's big one 120 years before the event, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Do you remember the major activity the Bible tells us Noah performed during this time other than building the ark and getting the animals loaded on it? Now, that's often what we think about with Noah is that part. But the Bible calls him an, a herald or a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20 alludes to this, that God was actually reaching out to the men of that day with a message of hope, and he was doing it through his servant, Noah. Now, someone once said that Noah's preaching was the longest on record. I believe it. That's 120 years of preaching the same sermon. Perhaps the closest thing we have to it in content is not his spoken words at all, but his actions. I mean, think about it. In just choosing to build the ark itself, the ark itself, Noah condemned the world because the ark stood for God's anger at mankind. And at the same time, it stood for God's willingness to rescue the righteous according to their faith, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Noah's days as a herald were before the event, but we should equally be ready to spread the gospel even after calamity befalls us and the big one hits. In the book of Acts, we have several examples of just this. In, after Stephen's death, persecution arose, forcing Christians out of uh, the Jerusalem and Judea. And as they spread, as Christianity went forth and was scattered, the Bible is clear, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and 4, that when they were scattered, they went everywhere preaching the word. And uh, this is repeated in Acts 11, 19 through 21. So gospel preaching, gospel teaching never ceased, even when people were bearing down on members of the church to harm them or cause them to be displaced from their homeland. So displacement or not, they preach the gospel. And um, if I'm not delivering the gospel in the good times, then I probably won't be delivering the gospel in the bad times either. And that's sad. And that seems to be contrary to the experience of the first century church. In the book of Colossians, and this is one of four prison epistles, you have uh, this book and uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. And in Colossians chapter four, verses two through four, and by the way, we call these the prison epistles for a reason. It's likely that Paul, the apostle who penned all these, was in Roman imprisonment at the time. And it's somewhat ironic what he is saying here, but it also is so optimistic. And it gets to this point of, are we set for gospel delivery? Because he writes to the brethren there in Colossae, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, why? That God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, Paul was physically under house arrest, but still asking the brethren to pray for an open door for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How ironic is that? But how helpful for how we view the big one. When the world around us is locked down, the gospel can still be spread, and it must be spread. And this is of paramount importance. Now, in conclusion, as we think back on these five points and how all of them are related to basically our being prepared and the various ways that the church ought to be prepared for those kind of events, I want you to consider this. The book of Revelation was the prepper's guide for the early church. It helped the church prepare for the soon to take place big one that was coming for them. It accomplished much. It was a heads up for those Christians, but more than that, it was a source of consolation because it didn't just speak of the persecution. That would just be one-sided. 
it spoke of the time after the church's enemies would be behind her, and there she would stand a beautiful city of victor. The book of Revelation helped the early church take comfort in the eventual victory over the forces against her for those who remained faithful in Christ. However, as is the case with the book of Revelation, such is the case with our victory. Victory in Jesus always comes after self-examination and correction. You ever wonder why Revelation chapters 2 and 3, where the Lord addresses each of the seven churches of Asia's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, have you ever wondered why that precedes the rest of the prophecy about victory in Christ? I believe it is because only after congregations, whole congregations now, take ownership of their spiritual condition for better or for worse. It's only after that that they are able to rest, to read the rest of the book and have the confidence that is spelled out there in the book of Revelation. Churches cannot benefit from what is written in Revelation chapter 4 through 22, which is meant to benefit and safeguard Christians through tough times, until they have done something in the present about what is written in Revelation 2 and 3. And so the first order of prepping for the big one is to become a Christian, to stay a faithful Christian, and to be restored. And as you see on the outline before you, this plan is available to all. We encourage you, beloved, if you're hearing the gospel for the first time and want to become a Christian, contact one of the members at Millview. Let us know how we can assist in having you to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if you need to be restored, beloved, because you've been a Christian, and because perhaps you haven't been as prepared and maybe you're living as a Christian today is not like what it should be. And it's not like what they did in the New Testament church of the first century. Beloved, we stumble. We make mistakes. We can get back up. We can, we can allow God's being prepared to save us, to inspire us and encourage us and lead us back to him. He stands prepared today to receive you as you are. You need to know that and believe that. But come clean with him and come back to him and be renewed in your strength, in your Christian walk with him. If we can help in any way, we encourage you to make it known. I appreciate your attention so much to this lesson and hope that it is edifying to you, to the church collectively, to the brotherhood. I pray that it is of some value as we consider these very important matters. God bless. Make it a great week.